What is up, football fans, but most importantly, Houston Roughnecks fans. Welcome to the Roughnecks Rundown. A lot of things happened, a lot of people are gone, and we've learned a lot more about this team. So without further ado, let's get into it. I'm in the big leagues, Tony don't miss me. Ballin' like Houston, hey, feeling like Whitney. I need a bag, bro. Send it too quickly. All right, guys, episode 27. Uh, we're jumping into it. What do we got on the board today? Well, the biggest thing that we're going to talk about is the Black Sunday cuts. Uh, a lot of people in the community, specifically us, I think I was the first to tweet about it, so that's kind of cool, is Black Sunday. Uh, it was the day where the teams had to cut down from 75 to 58 players. It's reminiscent of when, what, Black Monday, when the NFL, the season ends after week 17, they go and they have to decide on future contracts, and everybody who doesn't sign a futures contract is released. So it was sort of reminiscent of that. So. Black Sunday for the UFL. Then we have a scrimmage recap. So I've talked to a bunch of different people, players, coaches, players on other teams to try and get you guys the lowdown on the scrimmage between the Roughnecks and the Brahmas. Again, technically not fully a scrimmage. It's not like they played four quarters, all that stuff, but we'll get into that. Then we're going to talk about new signings. We have two big new signings since the last time that I talked to you guys. And then we're going to talk about my projected defense. Now, I had a projected defense before, and it's definitely different now that Black Sunday happened. So we're going to get back into that, and I'm going to make a second prediction and see if maybe that one can actually carry into the season. So let's get into it. First topic, we got Black Sunday. A lot of names and a lot of surprises on Black Sunday for the drop from 75 players to 58 players. And again, they're going to have to drop another eight to get down to 50 uh, before the season. but. Every name on here is somebody that I really like because I cover the team, but the biggest surprises, number one, Luis Aguilar, who holds the USFL record for most field goals in a game, eight field goals. Uh, he was on the Philadelphia Stars and they beat the New Jersey Generals. Literally all the points they scored were his eight field goals. Nick Buchanan is a very surprising one. If you haven't followed the Houston Gamblers um, that much for the past two seasons, he started every single game at center for the Houston Gamblers coming out of Florida. Dude, that's just a huge surprise. Jack Kramer, who we picked up from the New Orleans Breakers, apparently has won out at that position enough that they sent home a guy who started for this offense the past two seasons, started every game last year for CJ and uh, Coach Eric Price. So that's a huge one. Isaiah Chambers led the league in tackles for loss last season. Gone. That one very much surprised me. Uh, the next couple you could kind of, you know, they were on fringe players a little bit. Then Reggie Howard Jr., who is a former all USFL player, huge pickup, a name that people really talked about when we picked him up in the dispersal draft. Man, even the players that I talked to, they said, yeah, no, that's a surprise. We didn't expect him not to show up on Monday. Then you have a uh, former Super Bowl champion, Ryan Izzo at tight end. He got beat out by, uh, you know, the New Jersey generals tight ends that we picked up Braden Bowen and Woody and then we have Clint Sig and we have Rodell, Big Rock. So Ryan Izzo didn't make it. JJ Johnson, Jeremiah Johnson, right there, number two with the chrome visor. He was a starter the past two seasons for the Gamblers. Before that, he started all five games with the Houston Roughnecks of the XFL 2020. He was a huge name to come off this list where I thought, wow, I cannot believe that they just dropped JJ. I had him projected as my CB1 on my projected defense. Well, then yesterday, they post a photo, well, I guess two days ago when this comes out, we'll see. They post a photo with him, and I literally texted you know, people within the organization. I said, hey, man, you, you guys might want to pull this down. Like, JJ got dropped. It's a little bit insult to injury, all that kind of stuff. And they said, nah, he's back. That's, that picture's from today. So uh, UFL analysts kind of called it a vet day, you know, JJ got a couple days off, and then he's back at practice. So JJ's back. I'm very glad today uh, there was a media meeting with Coach CJ. Uh, he was asked about it, and he said that since coming back, they really like what they see from J.J. Johnson. So it was kind of a light the fire under him kind of thing. I think maybe, you know, he's been starting the past three seasons on the Houston team of the USFL XFL, and they thought, hey, let's just light a fire under him a little bit, I guess. And it seems to be working. So he's back. Very, very happy about that. Then Shamari Jones, Ryan Nall. Ezra Gray, running backs, they decided. Coach Thash, the running backs coach, told me going into the season, they will have three running backs. 
I thought that they might not make the full cut down to three until the 58 roster down to 50. But no, they said, we know who we want. It's Tion Evans. It's Mark Thompson. And it's TJ Pledger. So those are the three going into the into the season. That's very exciting. And then Coach CJ also mentioned in the media today that uh, one of the wide receivers, they're also mixing him in with running back a little bit. So that's cool. We kind of have an RB4 utility joker player. Uh, I'll get the recording of that and I'll post that for you guys to see. Then Diane Lake, Dan Lake, humongous surprise to me. Dan Lake was our third best graded player last season by PFF. He started all the games. Everything that I'd heard from other defensive backs, uh, defensive backs coach Brett Maxey loves Dan Lake. He's one of his golden boys waved. That one threw me off. I did not see that coming. And then the last really big one was Kalen Tolson. I had him projected as a starter. He started all 10 games for us last season at middle linebacker. He was a great middle linebacker when it came to mobile quarterbacks because he is very fast. And so seeing him go and then T.O. Redding, man, we took T.O. Redding in the original USFL draft and he's gone. He just never got the respect he deserved. And, and I was very sad to see him go. I hope he lands somewhere. He was in the IFL before the USFL. If he's got to go back there and prove it again, man, he's going to do it. T.O. is a great guy and I'm very sad to see him go. So Black Sunday, that was a tough one. Now we get to something that everybody really wanted to know about. There was a lot of questions about the scrimmage. They said, oh, you know, people were posting, oh, Stallions up 3-0 in the scrimmage. That's not how these scrimmages work. I've been to these scrimmages. I was there last year for the Houston Gamblers scrimmage. It's not like that. They literally run like three kickoffs. Then they have uh, three offensive series for one team. Then the other team kicks off. Then they have three offensive series for the other team. Then they kick three field goals each. You know, it's a set amount of plays. So people were posting, oh, Stallions are up 3-0 in the scrimmage. And I was like, that's not really how that, that works. But it's cool. You still get a lot of reps. You get to see a lot of things. And it was the last thing that they got to saw, got to see, not saw. It's the last thing that they got to see before they made the cuts for Black Sunday. But the key takeaways that I heard when I talked to players, coaches, all those things, the D-line worked the Renegades offensive line. I heard that they were just moving them. Uh, and that's with the Roughnecks defensive line right now. They have some guys that are taking time off. They didn't play a lot in the scrimmage because they are working through some, you know, bumps and bruises that they got getting pads on. So it was just a few defensive line guys, and they just absolutely railroaded the Renegades offensive line, which offensive line is huge in these leagues. So that's very important that we were able to do that. It gives you a lot of hope and not that surprising. We have probably the best defensive line in the league. There's only one other one that you can even say is close, and that's the D.C. defenders, but we are the best defensive line. We dropped in all USFL defensive linemen. That's how good we are. That's how deep the talent is. Then, Reed Sinnott can spin it. Excuse my pun. I thought it was very funny. Uh, and also last week, CJ, Coach CJ in the media, he said, uh, Reed spin it, and I just thought that was very funny, so I've been rolling with it ever since. Reed Sinnott can, can throw the ball, man. Uh, I heard from multiple people that were watching, that were there playing, that the offense looked good. They looked much better than they looked against um, the Renegades. So that's a little confusing. I'm talking about the scrimmage and the joint practice a little bit. So the D-line worked the Renegades O-line. They also worked the Brahmas. Apparently... I heard from a couple D linemen that the Brahma's offensive line literally did not want to be there. That's one of the last things. So that's a big thing. Uh, Reed Sennett, this is against the Brahma's in the scrimmage. Reed Sennett looked great. The offense looks good. The receivers were catching balls. The routes were crisp. They were getting open. It was very impressive. Uh, TJ Barnes, defensive lineman for the DC Defenders. Last year, he was an all-XFL uh, defensive lineman for the Renegades. He still talks to the Renegades a lot. He heard that the... He, Roughnecks put belt to ass on the Brahmas, which I don't know if you've ever been spanked with a belt. Usually it doesn't mean that you were doing something good. So I, that was exciting. That was fun to hear. And then, like I said, I heard from a player that the Brahmas didn't want to be there. He said, let me tell you, man, they did not want to be there. Now, I talked to a few coaches, and of course, they're giving you coach speak. They're going to say, oh, you know, I thought we did well, but we can always do better. But that's what you want to hear. If you hear, I think we could do a little better, that means they did well. When you're hearing we look like expletive, then that's when you need to start worrying because they're being brutally honest. 
They're never going to be like, we were absolutely amazing. We killed it. So I think things are looking good. Things are trending upward as far as the joint practice and the scrimmage went. A lot of people like to say that we lost the joint practice, that we looked bad. They posted a couple one-on-ones where defensive backs got burned. Those defensive backs aren't even on the team anymore. They got cut before Black Sunday. And then now you're going to come at us on a drill that is literally, if the receiver doesn't win the one-on-one, they're a bad receiver. They need to go home. So that's dumb. If you talk to other players, they said when it got into the team drills, when it got into actual running plays, the Roughnecks look fine. So don't get worried. Don't listen to the media. You know, there's some people out there that like to say that they're insiders and they know things they listened to like one player who wasn't even there. So don't even worry about it. Now, moving on to the next thing. We have new signings, and this is very exciting. Coach CJ in the media uh, last week, he talked about bringing in two new guys. He didn't say names because they hadn't signed yet yet, but apparently they signed like immediately after. So they cut two defensive backs immediately after the joint practice. They were the only team to cut players after the joint practice. It seemed abrupt and out of nowhere. But Coach CJ said, well, we have two guys who were on futures contracts that we're trying to sign. And then I heard that the two guys who got cut after the uh, practice, it was kind of already decided because they found out that they were going to be able to sign these two dudes on futures contracts, one of them being Corn Elder here. It's Corn, And so they they already knew that they were going to let those guys go. So it didn't really matter how well they played in the joint practice, which is tough to hear. And, you know. It hurts. I like these guys a lot. But we picked up Corn Elder, who has played on the Panthers, the Lions, the Giants, the Commanders. He was drafted in the fifth round, runs a 4'4", 940. He's 5'10", 183. He's a little bit older. He's 29 years old. But he played at Miami. He's very physical. And I've been told that he's playing all the positions. He can play outside corner. He can move inside and play nickel. That's very important in these leagues. I say it all the time. You have to be able to play multiple positions. You can't just come in and say, Hey, I play left side corner. That's not going to fly in this league. You got to play multiple positions. Like I've heard a lot of good things about Markel Roby. They say that he can play any position in the secondary. That's what you got to be to make this team. So for an elder, a guy who's coming in, he's a veteran. He's played in the NFL since he was drafted by the Panthers in the fifth round. He's been at least on a practice squad every year. This is a very good veteran talent to bring on. Who's Probably going to be a starter and make an impact. We'll talk about that later. Then a guy who I'm almost positive is going to be a starter, Jimmy Moreland. Jimmy Moreland coming out of James Madison. He was drafted in the seventh round by the then Redskins, now Commanders. He started a full season for them. If you go look, compared to other players in this league, they don't really have stat like professional stats in the NFL. Jimmy Moreland started an entire season for the then Washington football team. So he was drafted by the Redskins. Then they became the Washington football team. He started a whole season with them, put up some good highlights. You can go find them online. 5'11", 182. I think this dude, hands down, starter week one on the outside at corner. I think Jimmy Moreland is a great pickup. This is one of my favorite pickups we've had in a long time. Uh, You just don't see talent like this come into the NFL that often unless you're a defender's fan. But very, very excited for Jimmy. He also has a great following online. Man, his post blew up when I posted about him getting signed. So very excited to see what Jimmy can do. Moving on, then we have game one starters. So like I said, I had predicted the game one starters. I was so wrong. The entire secondary that I predicted starting was dropped by Black Sunday. So that's out the window. Then two of the linebackers I had starting, one of them gets no time and I haven't heard great things about. And then the other one was waived. So I had to go completely reevaluate those positions. Now, I think I'm still completely right about safeties. I think Manny Bunch, Donald Rutledge Jr., it is their job to lose. And I don't think they can lose it until at least week one or if they get injured. Knock on wood. We hope that doesn't happen. The defensive line has not changed. I still think it's Chris Odom and Adam Rodriguez on the outsides. I think they're the most dominant in camp right now. I think Ronnie Bingham is going to move in and be rotating with them a lot. They want to make sure that they can have fresh legs whenever they need them. And then I think Toby Johnson and Alive Sagapolu are the starting defensive tackles. I do believe that Keontae Shad is showing out in camp and that he looks good. I think he's going to rotate in, but I think first down week one, I think it's going to be Toby and Alive. Those are my things. Now, Linebacker, I had to go change it. I still think Reuben Foster is LB1. 
He's going to be the guy with the green dot on his helmet. I think he's going to be running it. Then I think JT Tyler, who enough people do not talk about yet. They will. He's very good coming out of Princeton. JT Tyler, I believe, will be the uh, third linebacker. So when they have packages that require a third one, I think he's coming in. But I think linebacker two is going to be Gabriel Sewell. I have heard so many good things coming out of camp about Gabriel Sewell. The coaches love him. The players love having him in the locker room. Gabe Sewell is a name to watch. Him and Ruben are going to be the top two linebackers on this team. And I think JT Tyler will be the guy who rotates in with them. Then we go to corner where I was just absolutely wrong. Now, I had J.J. Johnson as my CB1. He was waived. He was brought back. He just had a couple days off. I think he's going to rotate in, but I think they brought these other guys in for a purpose and with meaning. And I think that they are going to start week one. I think, like I said, Jimmy Moreland, hands down, he's going to be starting on the outside, if not starting at nickel uh, or following their, their best receiver. Jimmy Moreland will be in there. I believe Keandre Thomas, this is a guy who was elevated a couple times last season by the Packers. He had a futures deal, and then it fell through, and he came over to us. I think he's a great talent. Those are our two best pickups since the season started, Jimmy Moreland and Keandre Thomas. Then I think Corn Elder, with the way that he can play multiple positions, I think he's going to start, and I think he's most likely to play at nickel. So this is who I have now for Game 1 starters. Uh, I already was way wrong, so I'm changing it now. I make the rules, so it's whatever. We'll see how good this is. After the 58 to 50 cut down, I may have to change this again, but we'll see. Then uh, hopefully I'll be doing a video soon about wide receivers, quarterback battle. We've learned some things that we heard from Coach CJ, but I just have a lot happening in my life that's hectic right now. But I'm going to try and get that for you. So whew, hopefully next video, I will have projected starters on the offense. I'll be able to tell you about camp battles that have been happening with tight end, wide receiver, quarterbacks, running backs, the things you want to know. It's going to be very, very exciting. But until then, Rough them up, drill baby drill, and I'll see you guys next time. I'm in the big leagues, told them don't miss me. Ballin' like Houston, hey, feeling like Whitney. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching the UFM United Football Media. If you like that, please make sure to like and subscribe. Also, if you want more videos, you can check them out on our channel over here. The best one for you is right here. And then if you like mine, the rest of my playlist is right here. Thank you guys, and I hope to see you next time.